pleasure to be here this afternoon at a moment of such growth in the impact investing space. Um, but what we've heard, and I would contend that there are still more investors sitting on the sidelines looking for impact investment opportunities. Um, and perhaps to quote that great impact investor, Bono, they still haven't found what they're looking for. Um, conventional wisdom holds that it's a lack of investable product that is keeping them from investing. And many of you earlier today answered in a poll that that is why you think there are not more impact investors. I'd argue it's because we've done a terrible job of defining what we mean by impact. And I don't mean it's about impact measurement. We've made a ton of progress with SASB, GEARS, IRIS, uh, and there's a debate about whether you can, in fact, measure uh, impact. I'd, I'd argue it's instead because we do a terrible job of impact management. And by impact management, I mean the process by which we set investors' expectations about what is achievable, map those expectations into their portfolio, find investment opportunities that can link back up to those expectations, help companies and funds maximize for impact where appropriate, and then report back on what has been achieved. Let me give you an example from our portfolio at Bridges here in the US to give it some color. Springboard Education is an after-school education enrichment company based in Boston that serves kids after school with a credentialed teacher in a classroom providing them with a safe place to complete their homework or just decompress after the day because their parents can't pick them up or aren't at home at three. They serve about 5,000 kids in 13 states, 88 schools, mostly public and charter schools. After school programs are a huge pain point for school administrators. They juggle a handful of volunteer programs, and they see good kids do bad things when left to their own devices. They also watch as the widening education achievement gap leaves lower income kids behind. Upper income kids after school and over the summer have enrichment programs while lower income kids are left at home. Springboard is a godsend for working parents, like a single mother recently arrived from the Dominican Republic in DC who works long hours at a local restaurant and knows that her son is, is finishing his homework and is taken care of at DC Bilingual because of the Springboard program that we operate there. She doesn't have to worry about who he's hanging out with or where he is. And he's improving his educational performance as part of the program. When we at Bridges think about the impact of Springboard as an investment, we do the obvious. We count the number of kids served. We think about the socioeconomic status. We ask about whether they're attending school more frequently, because kids who complete their homework more often attend school. And then finally, we wonder whether or not we can prove that the educational achievement gap is closing. When we report this data, we collect it student by student, classroom by classroom, school by school, district by district, up to the company. We then at Bridges look at it and ask, does this meet our objectives? We then report it back to the advisors and the staff of the asset owners who wonder how our investment in Springboard is doing. They then compare that investment in Springboard to everything else in our portfolio and every other impact investment in their portfolio and every other investment in their portfolio. And what we hear from them is that they're kind of confused. They don't really have a structured way for understanding and putting in context the results that we're offering them. So even a high impact company at a fund deeply committed to impact producing information is not satisfying that investor need. But there's hope. Uh, we're working on a project called the Impact Management Project. We're working with a number of asset managers like BlackRock, UBS, PGGM, foundations like Ford, Omidyar, Kellogg, and MacArthur, and uh, infrastructure organizations like the GIN and Tideline to better understand not just how do we find an impact measure, but rather how can we build an impact management convention. A convention that would not be dissimilar to the convention that guides the thundering herd that Andy Sieg talked about earlier today. The thousands of asset advisors who if I were to walk in today and say, hey, I spoke at this economist conference, I got this really big speaking fee, how do I invest that $10,000? That's a joke, that's no speaking fee. Um, <laughs> wh whether it's Merrill Lynch or UBS or on the phone at USAA, they'd ask the same questions. Risk, what, uh, what's my risk tolerance? What are my liquidity needs? What's the time frame for when I need this investment by? What else have I invested in? And while those asset advisors may recommend fundamentally different products, the process, the convention that they would go through is essentially the same. If I were to ask, I got $10,000, how do I invest it for impact? I'd probably get a blank stare or 
Still yet an admonition that you cannot invest for impact. Or more likely, perhaps something totally out of context, like how about an ethical screen fund or a wind farm or microfinance? Because there's no skill by which that advisor can understand my preferences and help me map those into my portfolio. But we're working on that, and hopefully by the end of this summer, we'll have a set of tools that can build on a lot of the great work that is happening and provide a more coherent framework. For it to be successful, I think there are three key things. The first is the concept of impact fidelity. Fiduciary duty, executive orders notwithstanding, is an incredibly powerful concept that I think is in fact holding back impact investment because asset advisors are, are, are tying themselves down to the concept that they must adhere to the fiduciary duty of their clients. Without a counterweight of impact fidelity to remain faithful to the impact objectives of those asset owners, fiduciary duty will prevent impact investing from scaling. The second is common reporting standards. We at Bridges take great pride in the quality of our impact reports. Every year we write up the stories and the data of each investment and we share those with our limited partners. But it does kind of confuse me that we are required by our limited partnership agreement to report audited financial statements that look exactly like SJF or DBLs, but we have freedom to do whatever we want with our impact report. For the sector to scale, we're gonna to have to have more consistent uh, uh, impact reporting. And then the final thing is we have to link impact to financial returns. Unless we can prove that impact is part of the economic logic, whether it is a philanthropic concessionary strategy or a market rate strategy or a public equi equity strategy, unless and until impact is part of the allocation decision, perhaps the carry waterfall, impact will remain a second class citizen. So in a world where impact fidelity is as strong as fiduciary duty, where impact reports are as clear and consistent as financial reports, and where an impact track record matters as much in raising a fund as a financial track record, that's a world where we will have mainstreamed purpose-driven capital. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, without getting too political around this, the, 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 you mentioned the fiduciary duty. And in the context of, of the executive order last, last week, two weeks ago now, um, potentially suspending the fiduciary rule, can you sort of just, just give us a sense, sense here? You think that would actively um, be a good thing for impact to suspend the fiduciary rule? No, I don't. I think fiduciary duty is important, but I think we do need a counterweight to it that helps us understand an investor's impact preferences and remain faithful to them. I'm an asset owner. When I invest through you know, Fidelity, they need to understand if I'm choosing a renewable energy uh, portfolio because of its renewable en energy uh, uh, investments that I want to invest in a certain kind of um, project. Uh, and, and that needs to carry on down through that chain of capital for me as an asset owner uh, into the companies I invest in. And right now, there's a handoff, there's a, a poor articulation of what I want when I'm investing in something sustainable, uh, and we need to help me define that better, and then if I define it clearly, remain faithful to that over the life of the investment. Mm -hmm.